Okay. I went with it. Okay, so <laughs> I've just been kind of laughing through the last 24 hours uh, and crying occasionally, but um, I, I hate public speaking. I dread it. it was, it's like the worst part of this new role for me <laughs> is getting up in front of everyone. Um, like my mouth is super dry right now. <laughs> I feel like I have to keep like drinking water. Thank you, Kurt, for the water. Um, and um, I like I have to get over my nerves, so it takes me a little bit to like settle in up here. So <laughs> don't mind me, because um, I really I want to share what God has for us. I'm just a little uh, nervous about it. Um, so generally, what I do is I, I <clears throat> make fun of myself so that I feel more at ease while I'm up here. And I wasn't going to mention this at all until I got here. <laughs> And um, they told me I had to wear this. And I was like, oh, great. And I don't know if you saw this, <laughs> Kirk, but um, I have this big mark on my neck, and it's not a hickey. <laughs> like, I just wanted to make sure he knew that, because <laughs> nobody would have seen it, except for he's, like, hooking me all up. And, you know, <laughs> I know, but I, it, it's not. We... <laughs> I wasn't going to say anything about it, but you can kind of see it if you get close to me because my shirt falls off. Anyway, we got this new cupping thing, you know, where you put suction onto a cup and it helps relieve sore muscles. So all of us in our family were doing it last night to each other. And so that's that. Nobody needed to know, but I thought I'd just... <laughs> um, okay, so like I said, I really, really hate being up here. Um, Sometimes I'm just like, please, can, is there a toilet to scrub? Like, I'd rather be doing that or vacuuming a carpet behind the scenes. Um, but God was, yesterday, he's like, no, wait, we've got something. We can, we can do this. Um, and I was like, okay. So I had an inkling of what I wanted to talk about. And really, today is going to be a lot of storytelling. I love to tell stories. Um, so I was going to share some of them with you with a point. Hopefully, you'll get the point, too. But um, like two hours in, it was, my, my talk was becoming very academic. And I was like, oh, this is not the route I want to go. So I went off to work, and I came back. And um, yeah, I was like, OK, why did I say yes? Really, why? <laughs> what was I thinking? I could pull something together with Jesus, of course, in 24 hours. Um, but. What I have is something that I feel is really disjointed, and I hate that, right? I'm like a type A, give me, you know, four months notice if I have to do a talk so I can really do a good job, and it's going to be amazing, and um, I was writing down kind of how I felt, and I, <laughs> I said, um, I felt a great pressure to get it right and to make it super awesome, and that wasn't what I was feeling when I was preparing it, so I was like, oh my goodness, I'm going into this already defeated. Um, but, but we pushed through, and um, so I just ask for you to be patient. It is a little disjointed. It's not what I would have offered, right, if I had had months or even weeks to prepare. Um, but one thing it reminded me of, this is my first story, so hopefully you guys tolerate the story as well. But um, I was in Malawi, and uh, I don't know, seven, maybe ten years ago, and... <laughs> Um, I was put in a similar situation, and this is what, why it, brought, it came to mind, because um, we were driving into town with a team. Um, Doug Harper was with me, Steve Starkey, and I think one other person. Um, and the team leader over in Malawi told me, he's like, Rachel, that's how they call me, Rachel, um, we have a great honor for you. Um, I've arranged for you to speak to all these um, caregivers at the hospital. And I was like, what? Um, he's like, yeah, all the nurses and the people who take care of all of our sick, we thought you would be perfect because you're a nurse too. You could come in and you can encourage them from the word of the Lord. And, and I was like, oh my gosh. Um, this happens all the time in Malawi. They're, they're like, this is a great honor. And I'm like, no, it's not a great honor. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to talk about. Um, I have nothing. Like, we're already going to town. I have no Bible. Um, I have no notebook. And I'm like, oh, I'm so mad. Like, I, I'm not prepared. And I'm, I'm totally put on the spot. Um, and I just want to say this really quick. <laughs> 
when I tell stories, my kids are like, Mom, you're yelling. Like, you're really getting into your story, and we're in the middle of Target, and it's super mortifying. Like, you need to tone it down. So if anybody is like, I, you're talking too loud, just be like, Rach, tone it down. Okay. Um, so we're driving in, and before we go to my appointment that I didn't know I had, um, I'm like internally just freaking out about it. Um, we had to stop at this other meeting with Doug, and we were, it was official. It was like, we were in a government building, uh, the, Ag the Department of Agriculture, and we were talking about um, farms. And I was along for the ride. ride. I don't know anything about farms. I don't know how to, you know, plant and do nitrogen, you know, chicken soup, or like this fertilizer thing. I'm like, I don't know. So I'm just with the guys, and I'm sitting in this official meeting. There's like a transcriptionist, and, you know, they're all wearing suits, and I'm like, oh my gosh. And I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to talk about tonight. This is horrible. Um, so they're having this official meeting with minutes, and um, I look over at Doug, and he's sitting in a chair next to me, and he's kind of like doing this. And I was like, what is he doing, you know? And he's kind of going like this. <laughs> and <clears throat> I was sitting in a separate chair, and I had a ponytail in, and there was a window behind me, and so I'm looking at him, and then I'm looking at the other person talking, trying to be all interested in this agriculture meeting, and um, you know, so my hair is flipping back and forth, and then all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, what is that? And so I start doing this, and I'm like, what is going on? And I look down, and I was like, oh, there's some ants, all right? Um, so I'm, I'm just calm, I'm just brushing them off, and then I'm looking at Doug, and he's kind of having the same problem, and I'm like, oh, whatever, this is Malawi, right? Well, come to find out, the ant nest was in the windowsill behind me, and my ponytail was like right in their tracks. And so every time I'm turning my head, being attentive, you know, um, I'm, I'm getting more and more ants picked up in my hair, and they're coming down here, and I'm, so I look down, and I'm like, oh my goodness, I am covered in ants. And I'm, I look at Doug and, there, and Steve, and I'm like, uh, and I, then I look at the lady who's taking notes, she's the only other female in the room, and she's like, she's like, <laughs> Yeah, that's the problem. So then they're starting to get in my clothes and biting me, and I'm like, this is, this is not like an American government building, right? Pristine and nothing's, you know, everything looks amazing. And I'm like, oh my goodness, so it's getting worse and worse. And so I lean forward. Well, that was a big mistake, because then I drug it all down my back. Um, so she looks at me, and I'm like, <laughs> and she just kind of motions with her head. So in the middle of this official government business, you know, meeting, we get up, and we just leave the room. And Steve and Doug are like, oh my goodness, what's going on? Like, they just got up and left. And she takes me out into the hall, and she's like, going like this. She's like, oh, you know, trying to get all these ants off. I'm like, it's not working. And I don't know if she can understand me. I think she speaks limited English. So we're out there, and they can hear, like, us track, trying to get this off. And I was like, it's not working. So she pulls me into somebody's office, and I just, just stripped. I was like, <laughs> Hi, I'm taking these off. And we're like, so they can hear us like howling, like we're both laughing. Never met this woman in my life, but I'm shaking out everything um, and trying to get back on. And the guys are like, we don't know what happened. Like, what is going on over there? Anyway, so we're all covered in bites. So that is a super long story that has nothing to do with anything today, except for the fact <laughs> that my meeting then got canceled. And I, I wanted to circle back to that because... I had forgotten about it with all this going on, but it was such, I was like, Jesus, I don't know how much more I can handle. Like, I'm going to now arrive covered in welts and, you know, itching, and I just, you know, stripped in front of a structure in the middle of a government building. Anyway, so that's my very long intro to help me settle down a little bit up here. Um, okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit this morning, since the theme is stories, um, about the importance of our stories. I know some of you were part of our group several years ago where we did a, um, Your Story Matters, right? Um, I know Christine was there. Um, I'm not sure if anybody else was, you can just raise your hand. But um, we just got, re oh yeah, Noelle, you're right. Um, so we got together and we were talking and sharing our stories. I think it's so important as women that we have a little bit of a platform. So everybody got like, I don't know, 30, I don't remember, 45 minutes. 
um, to share their story from front to end, right? And whatever they wanted to share. Um, they could leave stuff out if it was too embarrassing, or they can include everything like I do. So um, anyway, so it was a really, I felt it was, um, I loved it. I got to know women in this group and their stories. I'm like, oh, at church, I know. I know what she's been through. Um, I know how, you know, Jesus helped her overcome and that sort of thing. Um, so we, we would like to try and maybe do that again in, in January, starting in January or February. So that's just my little plug for maybe a, something you guys might be interested in doing. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit more specifically today about Jesus stories. Um, uh, what, what is a Jesus story? And I've been um, listening to this podcast where that's all it is, is these people sharing these encounters with God. Um, and I, I just wanted to read um, from 1 John. I need my glasses on here. Okay, so John was one of Jesus' disciples. Um, he... he he says that I am the one that Jesus loves. That's how he always talks about himself in the Bible. Um, I was like, really? Okay. Um, but this is what he writes. He says, From the very first day we were there, taking it all in, we heard it with our own ears, we saw it with our very own eyes, we verified it with our hands, the word of life appeared right before our eyes, and we saw it happen. And now we're telling you in the most sober prose that what we witnessed was incredibly this. The infinite life of God himself took shape before us. We saw it, we heard it, and now we're telling you so that you can experience it along with us. This experience of communion with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. Our motive for writing or telling is simply this. We want you to enjoy this too. Your joy will double our joy. And I, um, I think that's kind of the point of having a Jesus story, right, that you can share with others, is that it's something you've encountered and it touched your life greatly. It was either something that, you know, he provided something or he just had a word for you that was so impactful. Um, but the whole point is, is telling others so that they, they too can experience your joy, okay? Um, I know John experienced many things, and sometimes I feel like we're at a disadvantage in this because... <laughs> I mean, he says, he's like, we saw him with, my, you know, with our own eyes. I heard him talking with my ears. I put my hands on him. And I'm always like, yeah, that's so great for you. Because you know? for me, I feel like I am, in a way, sometimes blind um, and can't hear well. And I obviously can't put my hands on Jesus, right? So I feel like I'm at a disadvantage for experiencing Jesus like John did. Um, but Luke, you know, he's been... He's been telling us about this interactive relationship with Jesus, like this invitation to come in and go deeper, um, right? One that's closer than, you know, checking in for your orders or, you know, begging your prayers. Um, but the one where we hear, you know, hear the shepherd's voice and we follow closely behind him. Um, so I, I wanted to share with you another story. Um, that when we, when we start to hear his voice and we really train for it, um, we ask to hear it, we start pursuing it and searching for it, he shows up and he, you, you get these encounters that are super cool that you can share. So I just wanted to read one to you here. I need a little sip of water. Okay. I felt God inviting me for a walk down to the pond. This is a private pond on a dead-end street, tucked back in the woods with ferns and flourishing with frogs and ducks and geese and mosquitoes all during their season. I hadn't been to the pond yet this year since the melt of the snow and ice. Even though I had 10,000 things on my list, I went. At first, it was, I'm going to conquer this walk. But halfway there, I slowed to a stroll and began smelling the warming soil, still wet from a recent rain. I began to tune into the bird's song. And then it began to pour. An absolute deluge of warm water from the sky. 
And I began to laugh, and I asked, Oh, yep, you brought me out here for this, didn't you? Oh, yes, was the reply. You see, Jesus knows that I love rain the best. I love the sound it makes, accompanied by the thunder, its promise of restoration, the pause it forces you into by way of inconvenience. I love the rain, and Jesus loves me. I pressed on and stood by the pond for many minutes, listening to the falling rain, watching it bounce off the water a million times over. It dripped off my chin. It was comforting and quiet and purposeful and glorious, and it was mine, all mine in the moment. I slogged my way back home, pants almost falling off from the weight. I was soaked through to my socks, but smiling from ear to ear. It was needed, and I didn't know, but Jesus did, and I am so glad that I listened to the invitation and allowed myself to be romanced by the one who can drown me in love by drowning me in the rain. I just lost my place, hang on. Okay, so as you listen to that story, what questions came to your mind? You can shout them out or you can just internally dialogue them. This is any questions? Um, did you feel any longings being stirred up? Did anything come up to the surface while you were, were listening? I know that when I first started hearing other people's encounters with Jesus, I had a couple thoughts. You're going to hear them, obviously. <laughs> okay, so the first one was, yeah, right, that's ridiculous. That was my first, when I started hearing them, that was basically my attitude. Um, does God really do that? Does he speak to people like that? Does he interact with them? Um, I had a lot of disbelief because I had been taught as a child um, that God doesn't use his voice to speak to us. He only speaks through scripture. Um, but if you only believe Jesus speaks through scripture, then you're not going to ask to hear his voice, right? And the Bible specifically says that we can. Um, the second thought that I had was, hmm, if he's doing that for others, then can I get on, on this too? That's, that's what I thought, uh, that was my second thought. Um, am I missing out? And I, you know, I desperately don't want to miss out on something, um, especially if it's from Jesus. Um, so if it's available for them, is this available for me? How can I have a relationship like that, and how can I hear his voice? So all those questions um, really started me out on a journey of, of trying to hear his voice better, because I want to have a relationship like that with him. Um, so I learned first that asking is huge, asking to hear his voice. Um, and then... The second step that I um, started doing was really making myself hyper aware of what was going on around me. Because um, I think a lot of us go, you know, traipsing through life and we don't pay any attention to what God is up to. Um, we're set in our, on our agenda for the day. Um, but Luke said a couple weeks ago that God is at work in this physical realm just as much as he is in the spiritual. And we just don't see it because we're, a lot of times because we're not paying attention. Sometimes we don't know what we're looking for either. But um, so I just wanted to um, encourage you guys to start asking for these encounters um, because when you start asking, he has this way of showing up. Um, it's usually unexpected and it's usually really specific to you, right? Um, he has this way of, of speaking directly to you and into your corner of your life. Um, so um, last December, I began asking Jesus a question. This is a question that I ask him every year, and it's, what do you have for me in the coming year? And I know it's almost December again. 
Um, and I know a lot of us are not ready to face the new year. We still have, you know, the hurdle of Christmas. Um, but I just wanted to put this out there as something to consider um, after Christmas, maybe circle back to it. Um, Jesus, what do you have for me in the next year? What word? What idea? Is there a phrase or a verse? Um, is there a theme? So my husband and I do this every year. Um, we don't do New Year's resolutions anymore. Um, instead, we start asking Jesus, what do we need to be leaning into? What do we need to be exploring with you? And I think what we're really asking is, if he knows what's coming in the next year, right, with his, his foresight, um, we're asking him for his provision for what's coming up and his protection. That's really what we're looking for. Um, so I was, I was browsing in Cracker Barrel last January. I started asking in December, in January was in Cracker Barrel, we were waiting for our seats, and I remember I was browsing around all their cool stuff, and um, I looked up on this top shelf, and there was a sign there, and it, it said, Take Refuge, Psalm 91. And there was um, two things came to mind. It was super cute. It was like that farmhouse decoration, you know, everybody loves right now. Um, the first thought was like, I am not paying $39.99 for that sign. I'll, I'll go home and make it or whatever. Um, but the second was, was Jesus. And he, he was right there and he said, that, there it is. That's it. That's your theme for the year. Um, you guys, I can't tell you how fun it is to ask and to get an answer and then have it confirmed by Jesus. It's, it's like, oh my goodness, he, he does hear me, right? That's one of our questions. Is God ever, you know, is God even listening? Um, so some years when I do this, I don't get my answer until February or March. Um, initially, I would like kind of panic. <laughs> I'm not going to get a word this year. Um, but every time he's come through and he's given, given us something. Um, I really don't feel like we need more New Year's resolutions. I know for me, I go into them and then I fail and then I feel super bad about myself every year. So we've switched over to this and it's been so much more helpful for, for us. Um, we, we all need more of God's provision and protection. Um, so I started exploring Psalm 91. And if you guys decide to do this, there's so many ways to do it. There's not like a, you know, a textbook way to do it. For me, um, I read it in like four or five different translations to get a really good understanding of, what it's being, of what's being said. Um, I, I handwrite out whatever it is by hand. I look up words in the dictionary. I read what others have written about it. Um, there's just numerous ways to explore these themes, okay? But a major theme, and what I wanted to specifically hone in right now is, I feel like I'm like clinging to the mask. I'm gonna go over here, let me try that, okay? I'm just slumping more and more, okay. Um, was this idea of taking refuge in the presence of God and hanging out with him on a long-term basis in his home. And I had questions about that. I was like, okay, um, you're like a spiritual guy. and. I can't see you, but I'm supposed to hang out in your house. Like, what does your house look like? What's it, what's, what is, is, it, is it the temple, you know, in the Bible? Is it filled with smoke and you should be afraid? Or I, I just was, I was at a loss of how to like put this into, um, into my mind. Um, so I got an answer um, early on in the year and I just wanted to tell the story about it. Um, Oh, this is a horrible story. I'm probably gonna cry. Okay. So I have been looking together. I was looking to get together with these friends of mine. Um, they're really old friends, dear friends, still are. Um, we hadn't seen each other in a long time, and I was like, yes, you know, they fill my cup. We're gonna go. We're gonna catch up on everything. And uh, <laughs> it was horrible. I had been looking forward to it so much, and I got there, and within 40 minutes, I'm like, mm, I am done. I am. If I, could, if I could get out of this booth, I would go home now. But I was stuck in the corner of the booth, and they were all like around me. And I was like, I don't, you know, wouldn't want to be rude or anything. Um, just be like, hey, I'm tapping out, goodbye. Um, but they had um, 
in essence, you know, they had crushed my heart. They had peppered me with questions like, that's fine, you're catching up, right? But these were like kind of deep uh, questions that I wasn't sure I wanted to answer, but I felt like I had to because it was like an interrogation. And um, anyway, and then but what really crushed my heart is then they had laughed at one of my answers. Like they had put their head down on the table and was like having this rolling laughter at one of my answers that was like super important to me. And I remember I was just like, oh my gosh. Like, I can't even recover right now. So I'm, I'm sitting there for another two hours, and I have like this eh, fake smile, you know, trying to interact. But seriously, I was devastated, absolutely devastated by this reaction. Um, so I cried all the way home, and my husband is like waiting for me, and he's so excited to hear how this night went with my old friends. And um, he's like, oh my. <laughs> You know, you come in and you're just like so red and swollen and hiccuping. And um, I'm like, don't, don't. <laughs> I'm not talking to you about this right now. Um, so I went to bed, right? Cried myself to, you know, trying to cry myself to sleep. It was, it was terrible. Um, but as I was about to drift off, Jesus showed up. Oh, my goodness. Um, I, I found myself, I'll just read it. I found myself at the front of a large house. I'm like, oh my goodness, this is the house. Um, as I approached the door, it was flung open as if they had been waiting for me. The whole trinity was there. They, they pulled me into the entrance. This just makes me laugh now, but it, it, was, it was just, anyway, it was lovely. Um, the activity was if I had just been taken off the battlefield, okay? There's like this whole triage going on, all right? They're asking me, what's the damage? Where is it? Um, they're checking my pupils, and I was like laughing because I'm an ER nurse. I'm like, that's what we do. When people come in and they're injured and they're hurt, we're checking for damage and we're assessing the acuity, right? So <laughs> that's what they were doing. Um, I had collapsed on the floor, and someone said, I don't know who it was, but I'm not kidding, it was as plain as if it had spoken verbally. He goes, take her to the healing room. I have a balm for this. And I was like, oh my gosh. Um, okay, I was like, what? Jesus has a healing room in his house? Like, this was, it was also, all of this is coming in. All right, I went to sleep and I woke up and it was still fresh and so I, I started journaling. I was like, I, I gotta write this down. Um, so, in case you wanted to know what the healing room looks like, <laughs> um, there's a huge chair there and it can fit two. There's lots of plants and greenery. There's potions and elixirs and there's dried herbs. There's the presence of God. It was as if I was in the very heart of God, the center of his, of his house. Um, there was a tree there and it was the tree that heals the nations. There was uh, the river of life, right, that never runs dry? Yep. And then tons of sunlight. That's, that's what I saw. Um, and I had to come back to the word balm. I was like, <laughs> who uses that word anymore? <laughs> I was like, is that a salve, an ointment? I'm like, there's lip balm. Like, I, anyway, so I looked it up. Um, it's, it's a substance obtained from a tropical tree. This is just probably off of Google, okay? Uh, used for healing and soothing. Um, and so then I went to the Bible. I was like, where is this used in the Bible? Um, and it can mean soft music. It's referred to the balm of Gilead. Uh, it also means mint. And then Melissa, which I think is an essential oil, or well, I've heard of that one, um, or lemon scented. Um, so, this encounter sounds crazy, doesn't it? Like, let's go back to my main questions that I had. What? Does people talk, does Jesus talk to people like this? Does he have encounters like this with others? That's, that's you know, I, was, I could hardly believe it myself, so I'm not sure, you know, if you guys are going to be able to believe it. Um, so, the Bible tells us to test things by the fruit, right? Right? Um, what was the outcome of this? Uh, 
I was, um, I really felt loved and cared for by the Trinity. Um, I was like, oh my goodness. He like answered my question about part of his house. Like he has a healing room. That's super cool. Um, but I think the biggest outcome was that I was in such a place of being cared for that I was able to extend forgiveness to my friends. It wasn't like, oh, I'm going to hang on to this. I'm going to nurse this a little longer, right? Um, Jesus, had, Jesus had taken care of it, right? Um, okay, I want to switch gears just for a second. Well, probably more than a second. Um, I wanted you guys to just do a little exercise. So there's cards, index cards on your table. If you can take, I don't know, two or three minutes. And I want you to, and I'm really kind of switching gears here. Um, I want you to write down your dreams. Dreams you want, dreams you hope for. Yeah. Things that you want. They can hear me. Okay, I think most everybody's almost done. Um, so I also wanted to encourage you, besides looking for a theme or a word for next year, I wanted you guys to consider writing um, down your dreams. I started doing this a while ago, and the first time I did it, I had this many on my paper. <laughs> I didn't have any. I was like dream destitute. And I, I think back to that time, okay, I had five kids. I was like 
overwhelmed, I was weary, I was in the trenches, and we had limited funds, and it was like, what's the point? Why, why would I put any dreams down? Like, I'm like up to my eyeballs and everything else. Um, but over the years, um, I have developed the ability to dream. And I have found um, that if I get it down on paper and present it to God, that some of them are coming true without me really having to strive to make it happen, right? I turn them over to him, and I'm like, this is what I would love. Some of them, um, I started off really small, you know, like, oh, we really just, you know, things I needed and hoped I'd get. Like, I need a new minivan. My other one's about ready to die, right? So those kind of things. But as the years have progressed, I have gotten more bold and really settling into my heart. What is it that I really, really want? Um, what do I want to experience? Um, is there a relationship that needs to be repaired and I would love for that to happen? Um, it could be financial, it could be travel, it could be rest. Can I just, can I, can I have a weekend of rest twice a year, right? Where it's just me, I go off to a hotel or something. Um, so I, I was super anxious and I think the fear in, in dreaming is that it's not going to come true, right? That's your worst fear, is it? I'm not going to get what I truly want. And then you interpret that, and you're like, well, well, obviously God doesn't care about my list, right? Or maybe he didn't see it, or, you know, maybe I'm asking for too much. Um, but I just wanted to share. I had, I had two on my list this last year that came true, right? Um, just really quickly, the first one uh, was I wanted something published that I had written. And I, I made my list, and within two weeks later, I had somebody who wanted to publish something of mine. And I was like, oh my word. Um, and then the other one was that I had on my list, um, I would love acreage so that we could have a little hobby farm, right? That seemed super not possible at all. And, and it happened. Like, we closed on it maybe two months ago. And so I, I, I see these things that I, pre, I entrust to Jesus that I really, really want, and I don't hold him to it, right? Like, my relationship with him is not dependent on you coming through on these. Um, but he does care about the things that we care about. He cares about our longings and our desires. Some of those desires and dreams that he put in your heart um, is... Well, that's, that was my point. I got that all messed up. Um, some of your desires and dreams that you have are things that he actually put in there for you. And um, he, wants, he wants to make them, um, he wants them to, wants to make them work out. Um, so I just, um, when you get together, I didn't have time to type up um, questions and stuff, but when you get together in your small group, I just wanted to see if you guys wanted to talk about how you felt writing them out. Did you feel like you were dream destitute like me, where I was like, oh, what's the point? I have nothing. I don't, I don't even know what to put down. Um, or did you have a ton and it was like easy for you to dream? Um, or as you were writing it, were you like, oh, I'll put this down, but it's never going to happen? Like, what was your attitude in, in, in doing it? Um, okay. I am almost done, I promise. <laughs> Um, so these two journeys that I'm inviting you on, um, the theme or the word of the year, and then and, you know, entrusting your dreams to Jesus, I wanted to really encourage you to invite your children into this. Um, I know this is a mom group, and I didn't throw this on at the end to make it more mommy or whatever, but this is something that we have done. Um, we've invited them into our own word journeys, um, and then... Sometimes we ask, do you want to do it too? Do you want to, you know, what, what, do you want a word from Jesus for the year? And, um, you know, depending on age and understandability, right? Um, but um, the, the dreaming is huge. We did this with my kids, and I think kids have the ability to dream better than adults sometimes, right? Um, they have that childlike faith. But there was some in, with my kids where they were like, ah, <laughs> Jeremy was like, I want, a, I want a puppy and I want a hound dog, but Cider's putting a German Shepherd on his dream list, so I know he's going to get his and I'm not going to get mine. And it was like this huge deal. I'm like, oh my word, this is not what this was about. But um, So there was this, but it was that same feeling I got. I'm like, why am I putting this on my list? It's not going to happen, right? He had that same feeling too. 
Um, but I, I found their list like two years after we had done it, tucked back in the back of a drawer, and I, oh, you guys, God is so good. Like, I pulled them out, I'm like, oh my goodness, these are from two years ago, and I started reading through them, and it was like, on each list, three or four had, had come true for each kid, and I, and I didn't do it. Like, the first year, I was like, you only get three dreams. That's what I told them, this was me, you only get three dreams, and... <laughs> um, and then I'm secreting them away, and I'm like, all right, God, you got to come through. And I'm, I'm like looking at them, and I'm like, okay, I, 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 I can come through for God on these, but obviously can't do that one, right? So I was trying to make it happen for them, you know, and prove how amazing God is to them. I had forgotten about them, and I had tucked them in a drawer, and God had taken care of the list. He had, they were ever before him, and he had started marking things off their list that we had totally forgotten about. And I took them back to the kids, and I'm like, do you see your list? tell me how many have come true. Tell me these little dreams that you have that you were, and they're like, oh my. Like, this is the invitation, right? Into, into interacting with, with God. Um, so I just wanted to, um, I guess it's just so important that what, wherever you are in your spiritual journey is to bring your kids with you. Invite them along with you. Because my little one, she's... <laughs> She's tense her eyes. She's like, even just a couple months ago, she's like, I, I can't hear Jesus' voice. I, I don't think he's talking to me, you know? And she would get teary about it. And I'm like, yeah, I get you. Like, there's days I can't hear Jesus' voice. I don't even know what I'm doing half the time. Um, I'm a newbie at this with you, right? We're, we're doing this together. And um, she has this... <laughs> She has this thing where when she sees hearts in nature, that's t Jesus telling her that, she, that he loves her, okay? And she was going through a really rough patch in school. She has some learning disabilities. <laughs> and she's, um, she comes to me again, and she's like, I haven't seen a heart. I have been looking and looking for weeks, and there are no hearts. I don't think Jesus loves me. Do you see how you can interpret these things? And I'm like, okay. And I'm like, turn around, I'm like, Jesus, you better come through for my kid. This is how I am again. I'm like, give her a heart somehow. <laughs> so I'm trying to, you know, I'm like, so I had this rock shaped, or this heart shaped rock, and I put it under her pillow, and she's like, Mom, that does not count. <laughs> I'm like, I know, I know it doesn't count, but I love you too. <laughs> um, anyway, so I said, well, let's ask Jesus again, and then let's just keep our eyes peeled, right? That's what we do. We ask and we search, and we, 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 we wake up and we try and observe what's going on around us. So we were at Fowler Park, and I was walking along the, the water's edge, and I found this. <laughs> She's such a stinker. I t this is where it's been. For, for a couple years now. Oh, dear. Did I lose it? No, I did. Oh, no, I got it. Okay, so I found this. Okay, it was heart-shaped. Okay, it is fragile. It was down here, okay? And I was like, oh, my word. This is like a heart-shaped leaf. So I took it to her. I had to go find her. I was like, Soraya, look what I found at, at the park while I was just, you know, hiking. And this was her response, okay? <laughs> That's just one. Like, like, he must not love me that much. You know how, again, we interpret these things. And I'm like, oh my gosh. You know, this kid. But I feel like I'm that way sometimes too. I'm like, you, you showed me that you loved me here, but I need to hear it again over here and more, right? We have this, this, this desperate need to, to be loved. Um, and I was like, okay. I said, right, <laughs> young lady, come with me. So we walked down, and where I had found it, it was so funny that she said it to me because it was on a massive bush and there was thousands. And I took her back there and I'm like, girl. <laughs> I said, what do you see here? She's like, I see hundreds of heart-shaped leaves. And I'm like, okay, what did you just say? And she's like, I just said I only had one and I needed more. <laughs> and I was like, there you go. So I just, um, I just wanted to close with that story because our kids are watching, they're listening, they're, they're wondering too, how do I hear from Jesus? How do I know that he loves me? And as a parent and as a mom, I, I am like, I have, to, I have to come through for him if he doesn't. And you don't, you don't. He's, he's got it handled. He's got it handled. Um, 
even if it seems like there's a delay. So she went skipping off. She took this home. We've pressed it. And we found it. Um, we're flipping through this book for some reason. She's like, oh, my goodness. There's my heart from Jesus. And I'm like, oh, yeah. Remember how many did you actually get that we didn't pick? And anyway, so that's include your kids. That's all. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.